Here's a funny anecdote that led me to decide the topic of my talk today. I was once asked by an inquisitive friend, and I quote, Do mathematicians just sit at their desks all day, solving problems? To which I answered, well, of course not, before realising that I had in fact spent the past few hours camped out at my desk, pen in one hand, maths olympiad paper in the other. It seemed that he had realised there was a slight hypocrisy in what I had just said as he walked away with a wry smile. I emphasised the word slight, of course, as any mathematician would tell you, just because I befitted my friend's description does not mean that all mathematicians do, just as how the fact that 1 plus 1 equals 2 doesn't indicate that the sum of any two numbers is 2 as well. However, I knew that criticising my friend's logical fallacy would only prompt further condescending remarks. Hence, I let the matter slip, lest he continue to barrage me with naive insults on mathematics. Although this encounter may seem comedic and preposterous to you, what it did do was spark a fire of intrigue in me. Do all mathematicians sit at their desks solving problems, or is there much more to their lives? As you may have deduced from the title of my talk, it is in fact the latter that holds true. Not convinced? Well, through a captivating account of the lives of past mathematicians, I hope to, dare I say it, prove by counterexample that mathematicians, arguably more so than other professions, lead interesting and political lives. Now, just as any self-respecting mathematician would do in this scenario, I will split my proof into three sections. The first will be a commentary on the 17th to 18th century rivalry between Newton and Leibniz. The second will be a sobering recount of the life of French revolutionary and mathematician Évariste Galois. And the final component of my talk, an examination of the political views of Joseph Fourier. Let's set the scene. It's 18th century England, and there's a widespread discontent across the country. Unrest of a similar magnitude reigns in Germany too. You would be right in thinking that this was the result of a large-scale conflict, although this conflict wasn't a political one. Rather, it was a dispute about who invented calculus first, English mathematician Isaac Newton or German polymath Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. During this era of many new and impactful discoveries, there was a huge emphasis placed on scientific priority, the recognition of who invented what idea first. For example, we attribute scientific priority to Einstein these days for formulating relativity, and likewise to Newton for his work on gravity. With the fame and pride that came with being the discoverer of a concept, many mathematicians held disputes over who had priority Although these were often quite easily resolvable, whoever published the idea first would most likely be given priority. In those days, the two big shots in mathematics were Newton and Leibniz, and in the case of Leibniz, he was also an acclaimed philosopher and diplomat on top of his mathematical endeavours. Just to illustrate just how highly they were thought of, we can point to Alexander Pope's famous poem on Newton, in which he states, Nature and nature's laws lay hid at night. God said, let Newton be, and all was light. As you can probably tell, the respect these two men garnered was so great that any minor altercation between the two would invariably lead to a nationwide conflict. And this is exactly what happened in the late 17th century. Having studied the property of functions, Newton invented the field of calculus to examine the gradients of and areas under curves, a concept that there's documented proof that he first devised in the 1660s. About a decade later, Leibniz also discovered calculus. From this fact alone, it would be safe to say that Newton should have been given priority. However, Newton didn't publish his findings on calculus until the 18th century, whereas Leibniz did so in 1684. Hence, from this regard, it would seem that Leibniz should have been the one prioritised. In the end, due to his prompter publication, as well as his less cumbersome notation, Leibniz was the one who was given the title of the discoverer of calculus, in spite of staunch opposition from the English. When it comes to the famous physicists and mathematicians of old, 
There are very many inspirational success stories, stories of those who defied educational authority to rise to the very top. In fact, very few made it without having to face some sort of adversity. 1921 Nobel Prize winner Albert Einstein was considered really to be an above average student, with a poor capacity for memorization by his teachers. Taking this one step further, there are some who suffered from a lack of recognition both in childhood and adulthood, only for their ideas to be posthumously accepted. And then there's Everest Galois, a 19th century mathematician most famous for introducing symmetry in Galois theory, who was rejected twice by the French college École Polytechnique due to his inability to pass his entrance exams. And if you thought it would be when he grew up that he began to gain recognition, you would be wrong. In fact, he didn't even make it into adulthood to formalize his ideas on what we know today to be Galois theory. Years before his death, Galois had tried to introduce the seminal concept of a Galois group, although this was quite promptly swept under the carpet by senior mathematicians, who thought little of the then teenage Galois' radical ideas on algebra. Unfortunately, Galois' ambitions did not simply stop at reforming maths. In fact, as a revolutionary in 1830s France, he was frequently involved in political clashes. The day before his final duel, during which he was shot, almost miraculously aware of his impending death, Galois hurriedly wrote up his ideas in a letter to his Republic friends, which, as mathematician Herman Weil puts it, if judged by the novelty and profundity of the ideas it contains, is perhaps the most substantial piece of writing in the whole literature of mankind. The final components of my proof will be fittingly brought to you by forward-thinking French polymath Joseph Fourier, who is most famous for being the originator of the Fourier transform, an algorithm that allows us to attribute a mathematical equation to any curve. However, it was not only curves that he was trying to transform. In an era of widespread misogyny and radically right-wing views, Fourier was one of few who sought to transform the political landscape into one of equality. He believed that all jobs should be open to both men and women, that these should be assigned based not on gender, but rather on skill and aptitude. Furthermore, as an advocate for the rights of homosexuals, he held that any unharmful sexual expressions should be accepted, and that affirming one's difference can have social benefits. Interestingly, he was also the first person to have coined the term feminism, a word for which he is given credit to this day. Fourier's political work, as much as his contribution to maths, was well beyond his times, a testament to his positive influence on society. And with that, we conclude my mathematically rigorous proof of the interesting lives of mathematicians. Returning back to the sentence of the problem, if anyone ever asks you whether mathematicians just sit in their rooms all day solving problems, you can be sure to say no. And if they're still not convinced, don't hesitate to recount my three-layered proof by counterexample to them. Thank you.